All right, welcome back, everybody. We're going to continue today with the second and final part of our notes on Chapter 23, The Great Depression. So uh, thanks for stopping by and listening. Uh, look, um, don't forget to uh, smash that like button, subscribe to my channel, and uh, you know let's get those uh, let's get those subscriptions and likes uh, rolling on in. So anyway, why don't we go ahead and uh, hop right to it, and maybe we can keep this one a little bit shorter. So last time we kind of talked about how the depression happened, the economic side of things. Um, a little bit of the early response to to uh, kind of what happened happened with the depression, but there's also a lot of social response uh, to the Great Depression. And I mean, you know, there's the stuff we talked about last time, the immediacy of response, um, that uh, you know, people picking up jobs um, where they'd be underemployed as workers because they need to take care of the family, things of, of that nature. Um, you know, men running off as hobos to, uh, you know, try to find work uh, for the family. Sadly, a lot of times these guys don't come back, but sometimes they do or they send money back home or whatever. Uh, women finding jobs and entering the workforce, uh, sometimes to help out, sometimes out of necessity if there's no uh, man at home and no nobody else to, to bring home money for the family. So uh, there's those sort of responses kind of that, um, grit and determination of the American people to make the most out of this situation, uh, try to survive, try to take care of the family, do that sort of thing. Um, but there's a lot of other social pieces to the Depression uh, that come about and become very popular during the 1930s that have stayed with us ever since. I think one thing that people misunderstand about the Great Depression, because the way you learn about it is, oh, everybody's poor and everybody's lost all their money and, and, and stuff like that. And I've told you since the beginning of the year, um, don't take anything as an absolute, okay? A lot of people are struggling. A lot of people are hurting. Rich people, poor people, whoever. But people are still able to live their lives and enjoy some things uh, that, that uh, you would under normal economic circumstances that we'll talk about here. Uh, sporting events, you know, boxing and baseball in particular, uh, the movies were huge, uh, stuff of that nature. So um, while there's a lot of struggling going on, there's still people that are doing things socially, uh, and you're going to start to see kind of the modern world take shape here. Okay, and this is very small. So um, we kind of already mentioned kind of the American ideals. And that's what I was talking about before, how people respond to the Great Depression by men and women going out and getting jobs, men getting jobs that are somehow under their station economically, right, where they're getting jobs for less money than they probably are worth to the, to the workforce because they have to take care of a family, uh, running, uh, hopping on freight trains and trying to find jobs as hobos. American people respond in this way uh, because it's part of the ideal, particularly the male ideal of the time. You've got a family to take care of. You're the male. It's your responsibility, so you better go out and do that. Um, so the ideals of the American people, um, men and women ultimately, play a big role in us surviving and kind of make our, making our way through the Depression. Okay? Um, you know, men in unemployment. Uh, it's very hard for men to handle, you know, the, the concept of unemployment. Amer you know, the, the hardworking, you know, look, there's different types of people out there always. There's people that don't want to work and not working is not a big deal to them. But the typical American man, again, feels that responsibility that I need to pick myself up from my bootstraps and go to work hard and take care of my family and do whatever I have to do. So men deal with unemployment in all of these ways that I mentioned before, you know, whether they're hobos, whether they're underemployed, whatever. Um, another kind of interesting phenomenon that happens during the 1930s is um, kind of the age of bank robbers. Uh, and it results in something that um, some people call, I like to call the Robin Hood syndrome. So obviously we know Robin, who Robin Hood is. He robbed from the rich and gave to the poor and, and that sort of thing in England uh, after the Crusades. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a rash of 
bank robberies that took place all over the country. Uh, and some of our most famous criminals in American history came about during this time. Uh, John Dillinger, Pretty Boy Floyd, Babyface Nelson, Machine Gun Kelly, not the rapper. There was actually a guy named Machine Gun, uh, Machine Gun Kelly, Alvin Creepy Carpus, uh, lots of bank robbers and people that uh, Bonnie and Clyde, um, Jay-Z and Beyonce, uh, all kinds of bank robbers that, that, that came about, you know, during this era. And they would go and rob banks. They didn't necessarily give their money away to people. Um, sometimes they would. They, they'd give their money to poor people, but not very often. Usually they, they'd rob for selfish means, and they're committing a crime, obviously. But a lot of the American people who had lost their money in the banks when the banks had closed really kind of rooted on these these criminals because, you know, it was a way to stick it to the government. It was a way to stick it to the banks for losing their money, for screwing them over. And, uh, you know, there was this weird kind of fascination and uh, phenomenon that we call the Robin Hood syndrome because everybody kind of rooted for these, these criminals, these bank robbers to succeed, you know, to get back at the banks for having taken from them. Uh, there were limits to how much people would uh, support them. Um, as long as they weren't violent, as long as they didn't kill anybody, they were fine. But as soon as people started dying, um, you know, public sentiment started to turn against some of these these gangsters, uh, some of these robbers. Uh, and most of them met violent deaths. Uh, John Dillinger was, was shot and killed outside a movie theater in Chicago. Um, Babyface Nelson was killed... Uh, um, in a shootout, uh, Bonnie and Clyde were killed in a shootout. Um, uh, Pretty Boy Floyd actually um, was arrested and put in a jail in Dayton, escaped from that jail, and he was ultimately was uh, uh, caught and hunted down and was killed in a shootout in a cornfield in Indiana. So uh, violent deaths for these guys, but for a time they were looked upon almost in a heroic sense. We kind of went through the same thing again in the 1970s because the 70s were really weird, uh, where people had this fascination with serial killers. And, uh, you know, that's just a story for another time. But that was some weird stuff. So anyway, let's continue on. How does popular culture respond to the Depression? It responds in a variety of... Um, ooh, what the heck did I just do there? Um, it responds in a variety of kind of unique and interesting ways. Um, radio, of course, becomes extremely popular in the 1930s, even more so than it had been before. Radio is a great outlet for people to kind of escape reality uh, for a time, and people like listening to, to various uh, radio uh, programming. Um, amongst the most popular were shows like The Lone Ranger, um, comedy-type shows starring like uh, George Burns, uh, Bob Hope and people like that. And these people would really become famous really throughout like the entirety uh, of the of the 20th century. They would become stars in movies. They would become stars on TV later on. Um, and it's these radio programs, serial programs, as they called them in the 1930s, that laid the groundwork for television really later on. They would play these radio shows as if it was a TV show, but you're just listening to them. Uh, and they were extremely, uh, extremely popular, extremely influential. Uh, there would be comedy shows uh, that later morphed into situation comedy. Half-hour shows like I Love Lucy started at first as a um, radio-type program. Uh, soap operas, which were, you know, geared more towards women. The reason they call them soap operas is because they'd be on in the in the afternoons, and you'd figure only women would be watching. So the advertisements that would happen during uh, these soap operas would, would be all for like cleaning supplies and, and soap and stuff like that because they were catering to women. And that's how they got the name soap operas. Now, probably the most famous radio broadcast of the 1930s comes in 1938. And it's called The War of the Worlds. And um, a very a guy who became a very famous actor, a guy named Orson Welles, um, did this War of the Worlds broadcast where they did this thing where uh, they were reporting as a news story that aliens had landed on Earth in the United States and other places and were, you know, killing people and stuff. Um, and 
people tuned into the show, a lot of people had tuned into the show after it already started, and uh, the way it was being reported, they thought it was actually really happening. And uh, some people, you know, they didn't want to get killed by aliens. They were suicides. Um, and, uh, you know, crazy, this huge public panic. Um, everybody freaked out. And uh, Orson Welles, the actor uh, that was kind of the brainchild behind the whole thing, uh, had to apologize for, for all of it. Um, but the importance of this in the bigger picture uh, contextualization it shows you the influence that media uh, can have and is certainly going to have over people's um, perceptions and thoughts on things. Uh, you know, gosh, we see that play out today with, um, you know, all the misinformation out there and people reading all the stuff on Twitter that they think is true and all these other crazy stories and things that, you know, just have no basis in reality. But, you know, people believe stuff. And this goes all the way back to the 1930s and the War of the Worlds um, broadcast is sadly really a cautionary tale of, you know, this is what can happen because people believe the stuff that they see and the stuff that they hear. Movies become really, really big in the 1930s. Uh, now, so the era of silent films was important, but it was short. Uh, I think in 1927, was the first talkie, as they called it, the first film that uh, actually had, you could actually hear people talk rather than a silent film. And uh, that marked the beginning of the end of the silent film era, and silent films quickly kind of disappeared over the course of the next few years. Uh, and, um, you know, movies uh, grow increasingly popular uh, during the 1930s. They're a great way to escape. Um, you know, that's inexpensive for a quarter. You can get some, some popcorn and a drink and go see a double feature. Uh, and, you know, you can go into, if it's rainy, you can go inside, especially if you, you're living in a Hooverville and a shanty town or something like that. Um, it's climate controlled, so it's warmer in there or cooler in, in some places. Uh, so it's a great way for people to, um, you know, find uh, cheap entertainment and thrills. Uh, and it's another escape. It's escape from the realities of what people are dealing with. Uh, and that's a really important thing. It's the 1930s where we see Disney become really popular. Uh, the first Disney movies like um, Snow White uh, comes out in the 1930s. Some of the biggest films of all time come out in the 30s. The Wizard of Oz, Gone with the Wind, uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which, is, I'm, sure, which I'm sure is one of your favorites. Um, these are all movies that, that uh, come out in the 1930s and uh, represent um, a real good example of the culture and character of the time. Gangster films are really popular because, you know, the, the, the nature of, of the violence in the films are, are, is really a reflection on people, on how people feel about uh, their life and what's going on during that time. And of course, we have authors in the 1930s, lots of authors and lots of important uh, writings. There's escapist uh, and, and epic drama uh, novels like Gone with the Wind and, and things like that uh, that are historical. Uh, but probably the most prominent author of the 1930s is John Steinbeck. And he writes two, he writes a lot of books, but his two most notable books of the 1930s are Of Mice and Men, and uh, The Grapes of Wrath. And both of these books really characterize the realities of the Depression uh, for people. They, they, they take place out in the West where people are really hurt by the, the Dust Bowl and the uh, financial circumstances that people uh, are forced to deal with. Um, and, you know, it it's really expresses those rough and difficult um, circumstances that kind of everybody is, is kind of forced to live with in these uh, really hard and diffi uh, difficult times. Uh, and there's other uh, authors too, like uh, Erskine Caldwell, um, you know, John, De um, John Dos Passos. Uh, these people write a lot about, you know, the realities of the Depression. And, uh, but particularly Steinbeck's works um, really capture the Great Depression for people more than anybody else. Um, another important author in a different way 
uh, is Dale Carnegie, who wrote one of the most uh, popular books of all time. In fact, it was the best-selling book of the 1930s, a, a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it's really kind of regarded as the first ever self-help book, you know, looking for motivation and stuff like that. A lot of people blame themselves for theirs or their family circumstances during the Great Depression. Um, this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, is meant to lift people up and show them how to, you know, get themselves back together. And also, you know, just as importantly, help others out of the circumstances of the depression that everybody's forced to deal with. So lots of different things out there. Again, we're seeing that old pattern. We know American people love to read and the writers of the era um, do a great job of, of capturing, um, you know, the essence of the time period. So really as difficult as the depression is, the social and cultural aspect of the depression is really vibrant and growing during the period. So last real thing to talk about here is the presidency of Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover gets the blame for the Great Depression, and to a, to a certain degree, he deserves it. A lot of his policies, um, what he did, and, and more so what he didn't do during his presidency, um, didn't help the Great Depression. Uh, but he's not a bad guy and a bad person. He was somebody who probably uh, was just a really, was, was A, caught in the presidency at a really bad time. I think whoever would have been the president when uh, the Great Depression hit would have been, you know, would have had a tough time to get reelected. But Herbert Hoover um, is a guy that really gets the brunt of the blame for what happened. Okay. And part of this, like I said before, part of this really is, is Hoover's fault. Um, <clears throat> Hoover, uh, tries these different ways to kind of help the country uh, through the depression, but he's, um, you know, his, his fiscal policy is poor and his response to the depression is, is, is poor as well. Um, he's apprehensive to spend government money because he doesn't want to see a national debt grow, which, you know, it's one of those situations where you don't really have a choice, but, to, you know, we're in an economic downturn, a serious one. And uh, sometimes, you know, the government has to step up to help keep people afloat. Hoover tries a number of different things that fail. One of these is the concept of, of voluntary cooperation. Um, what Hoover called his plan to kind of get uh, businesses, um, you know, talk major businessmen um, to kind of keep production going and not uh, lay off or fire any workers. He tries to talk to labor and, and, and encourage labor and, and convince them not to um, demand better hours or better pay or anything like that. Uh, but if you think about it, while it's, you know, it's a nice idea, it's not very practical, okay? If people aren't making money and, and you're a business and why are you going to continue to produce more and more stuff that is not going to be bought? You know, you're going to lose you're, you're going to lose money as a business in that circumstance as well. So that's not, you know, that's not a, a, a very sound plan. Um, you know, and, and labor unions can only, you know, go so long without trying to fight for or argue for the needs of uh, the workers because that's what they're there for. So businesses didn't really buy into this plan. Um, it only lasted like a brief period. Uh, and it generally failed overall. Hoover really didn't know how to respond to the Depression. Um, another thing that he tries is something called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. This is toward the end of his presidency. They set aside $1.5 billion uh, for basically for social programs, um, for social programs to help out during the Depression. Uh, the problem with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation is Hoover only wanted to spend money on programs and things that would pay for themselves, essentially, um, you know, like building roads and bridges and things of that nature, which, hey, you know, that's, that, that's a great idea. But again, um, that's not going to be enough to help people out of the Depression. Uh, of the 
and and the other big problem the biggest problem of the reconstruction finance corporation is that hoover didn't use it enough of the 1.5 billion that was set aside uh, only about 300 million of it was actually used so you only used about 20 percent um of that money can you imagine today if we passed a 1.5 billion or trillion dollar bill for the government to use to help social programs and stuff like that and we only use 20 percent of that you know and people would be going crazy right what if the government what if the you know we, we we pass this stimulus bill and all that money's there to give people another stimulus but then you know biden or you know mitch mcconnell or whoever comes out and says um, yeah, well, we're only going to give everybody 20% and we're not going to spend the rest of that money, right? People aren't going to like that. So this program, while it's a good idea, fails essentially because it's not used enough. There's also various forms of popular protests that occur uh, during Hoover's presidency as he grows increasingly less popular uh, as the Depression gets worse. Remember, the there's no time once the stock, once the market crashes and the depression begins in late 1929 all the way until um, early 1933. The economy is continually dropping. It doesn't turn around at any point. There's not any like, oh, it got better, it got worse, it got better. Like we saw the economic drop when COVID hit last year. Um, you know, and it went down really quick, but then it, you know, it's, it's, it's gone back up pretty, pretty quick as well. That didn't happen for a few years once the Depression hit. It was a slow, painful drop where things just continually got worse and worse. So popular forms of protest include, for one, something called the Farmers Holiday Association. Well, key word there, of course, is farmers. Farmers thought it was a, would be a good idea to kind of come together and encourage one another to kind of withhold their farm products from the market, thinking that that would um, up the value of, of the crops, basically um, going on strike, so to speak, and not producing um, you know, anything or taking anything to market. Well, it was a farmer's plan, and obviously it, it, it failed rather quickly. Um, so that's one form of protest, and, and they try this in the Great Plains, uh, some people get on board with it for a little while, but it kind of quickly fades away uh, and fails. Economically, it doesn't make any sense to produce a good, spend money on growing crops or whatever, and then withhold it from the market. And you can't eat it all yourself. So that's, that's not a good thing. Probably the most popular protest of the Great Depression, of course, has to do with the Bonus Army. Now, the Bonus Army was... Um, a group of World uh, War, um, a group of World War One veterans who were promised a, uh, a check for having fought in uh, World War One. The check was for, I think, something like a thousand dollars for everyone who had uh, all the soldiers who had fought in World War One, and that had been promised to them by the government, and they were supposed to get it in 1945. Um, but it's 1932 and these guys are hurting uh, and they want their checks and the government won't give it to them. So um, they literally uh, get this big group uh, of, of soldiers from the war going and they literally march essentially on foot to Washington, D.C., to the White House, to the Capitol building and demand their, uh, you know, and demand their thousand dollar checks. OK, um, I'm sure you could probably picture that something similar happened recently, although nobody's asking for money. Um, and uh, the U.S. Army, of course, uh, as they come there and they refuse to leave, they they um, build their own little Hooverville in the shanty town like you like seen right here. It's not. Um, and they, and uh, they wait, uh, you know, on the other side of the river waiting to. Uh, um, you know, get their money. They demand Hoover give them their money. Hoover instead sends the actual army in to face off against them. Um, and interestingly enough, it was led by uh, General, uh, um, gosh, I think it was either, 
either MacArthur or Patton, who of course would be famous, uh, both of them from World War II, but it escapes me which one was there. I'll have to look that up and let you know in class. Um, but uh, they go there, they go there, get their money, and they're sent back and fired upon, and it r results in violence um, from the, uh, you know, by their own people, by the U.S. Army. Uh, this is what killed any slim chance Herbert Hoover had of getting reelected, right? When you turn your own military on your own people, um, you know, that is something that you're not going to bounce back from, right? Uh, when you got a bunch of veterans that just want money to be able to put food on the table and, um, you know, George Patton's riding, riding by in a tank and, uh, you know, firing at, uh, at former soldiers, you know, that's not something that Hoover's going to bounce back from. And obviously he doesn't. And, uh, the election of 1932 uh, is a blowout election, as you can see here, um, where Franklin Delano Roosevelt becomes our 32nd president of the United States. Only 57% of the people participate in the election, but he wins in one of uh, the biggest uh, electoral vote landslides in American history. Ironically, he actually didn't win, um, he didn't win Pennsylvania, which you'd think he would. Um, because it's near New York, which was his home state. And ironically, or not ironically, Herbert Hoover doesn't win California, which is his home state. Um, but, uh, you know, Roosevelt wins in, in, in big fashion, and the presidency of Herbert Hoover is over. Um, again, Hoover, not a bad guy, um, probably not the right guy to be president when what happened happened, but, you uh, um, you know, we're on to uh, a new president, a transformative president, and somebody who's going to be president longer than anybody else. A whole three chapters. So anyway, uh, that's all for this, and that's all for chapter 23, and I will see you next time.